Okay, now we'll have comments from John Whipple of the University of Illinois at Chicago. It's an honor to have the opportunity to comment on Tad's paper, Moral Evil and Divine Concurrence in the Theodicy. In the paper, Tad tackles a host of problems and interpretive questions concerning Leibniz's accounts of God's moral and physical concurrence with moral evil. He seeks to provide a systematic interpretation of Leibniz's views, one that emphasizes the interconnection between Leibniz's account of God's moral and physical concurrence with moral evil. While I agree with many of the claims that Tad makes in this nuanced and insightful paper, I have reservations about several aspects of his interpretation. In these comments, I shall focus primarily on Tad's interpretation of Leibniz's distinction between willing and permitting moral evil. Before proceeding, I would like to make a general point about interpretation of the theodicy. And this, of course, is not going to be any news to everyone that's read a lot of Leibniz in this room, but I know not everybody has read a lot of Leibniz, so I think it's worth keeping these kinds of texts in mind. As a number of commentators have noted, Leibniz distinguishes between popular public presentations of his philosophical system and more metaphysically rigorous presentations of it in some of his private correspondences. Leibniz feels compelled to write his published works in a popular manner because many people are incapable of understanding the cold, hard metaphysical facts. As he explains to Bale in a note on their private correspondence, I should not be in too much of a hurry to publish what I, what I have written, the point of which was only to provide some clarification for you, sir, and for some other people, so as to receive the same in return. I write not so much to make an impression as to investigate the truth, which it is often useless and even harmful to publish, on account of the uninitiated who are incapable of appreciating it and quite capable of taking it in the wrong way. Not only are the uninitiated incapable of understanding the cold, hard metaphysical facts, they're also prone to misunderstanding them. Leibniz's popular presentation of his philosophy in the theodicy is designed to minimize the possibility of such misunderstandings. Generous as this gesture may have been, it opens up a big can of interpretive worms. And I should say, I think that uh, I mean, this is one of the most important questions uh, in interpreting theodicy, what exactly this means, and I think it means lots of things in lots of different contexts. There's no one simple answer to what exactly is going on with respect to the more popular presentations. At the very least, it implies that we must be on the lookout for places where Leibniz might not be speaking in Metaphysico Rigore. I'm going to, I have some comments about the first part of, or uh, one part of Tad's paper where he uh, looks at the conversation with Steno um, uh, to see if in that text Leibniz is able to draw a distinction between his uh, merely permitting moral evil and willing physical evil, because that's the distinction that, that Tad's really trying to find some basis for uh, and that he find, thinks is, it's difficult to do. Now, when I, when I read this, I thought it seemed to me like he was criticizing, saying that Leibniz is having a problem doing this in the conversation with Steno. Uh, and my response was, well, I don't think that, I mean, Steno's not trying to draw that distinction uh, in the, uh, or Leibniz isn't trying to do that in the conversation with Steno. He's just trying to provide a general account of God's uh, permission of moral evil and the musician analogy that he gives is sufficient for that purpose. So uh, it's okay on its own terms. But what I think became clear in discussions with Tad is that Tad was saying, well, look, if we try to use this distinction that he draws there between uh, per se willing and per accidents willing, you're not going to be able to use that distinction in order to uh, provide a sort of metaphysical foundation for the distinction between God's merely permitting uh, moral evil and his willing physical evil. So we, uh, we I think, ag agree, on, agree on, that, on that point. You can't really use this, this text in order to do that. So I'm going to skip the co conversation with Steno. Tad's main focus is on Leibniz's view and the theodicy. He attempts to explain Leibniz's subtle distinction between God's willing physical evil and merely permitting moral evil by appealing to one 
the account of deficient causation that Leibniz invokes in his discussions of physical concurrence, and two, the different internal causes of physical and moral evil, the former results from appetites that are directed towards producing what is objectively the best effect, while the latter, quote, derives from volitions that are misdirected toward a merely apparent good. I have two initial concerns about this interpretive strategy. First, when Leibniz introduces the problem of physical concurrence, he writes as if the problem of moral concurrence has already been handled adequately. This objection leads us, quote, this objection uh, leads us to consider the physical cooperation of God with the creature after we have examined the moral cooperation, which was the more perplexing. In other words, God's moral concurrence was more perplexing, but we have dealt with it. Now it's time to consider physical concurrence. This suggests, at least initially, that Leibniz thought the distinction between willing and permitting could be drawn independently of his account of physical concurrence. And I'll just note that uh, the problem of moral concurrence must be distinguished from the problem of the author of sin. Leibniz clearly thinks that uh, in the theodicy, the latter problem can't be solved independently from his solution to the problem of physical concurrence. Uh, it's different in the early works, but uh, like the confessio, but that's a different matter. Second, Leibniz does not, so far as I've been able to determine, uh, explicitly appeal to different internal causes to explain the difference between God's willing physical evil and permitting of moral evil. What I think Tad is suggesting, in effect, is this. Although Leibniz presents the distinction between willing and permitting in the theodicy, he doesn't fully explain the basis for this distinction. However, we can understand it by appealing to an additional distinction Leibniz makes in other texts. This can be a legitimate interpretive strategy in many instances. But other things being equal, we should prefer an interpretation that can explain the difference between willing and permitting that utilizes resources that Leibniz explicitly sets forth in the theodicy. There is a strategy that Leibniz utilizes repeatedly to draw the distinction between willing and permitting moral evil. This strategy, which Tad mentions in passing, appeals to the distinction between antecedent and consequent will. The basic idea is straightforward. God wills everything that is good considered individually with an antecedent will, but he wills only the best possible world with a consequent will. Only the latter sort of will is necessarily followed by its effect. Anything that results exclusively from God's consequent will is only permitted, strictly speaking, because it was not willed individually with an antecedent will. Sins fall into this category. Considered individually, God does not will them. That is, they're not willed antecedently. However, sins are found intermingled in the best possible world. Although God might have created a world without sin, he does not do so because it would require choosing a world less that is less than the best possible. To choose something less than what is absolutely the best would be to, quote, fail in what he owes himself and what he owes to his wisdom, his goodness, his perfection. Hence, sins, which are included in the best possible world, are merely permitted by God. This, I believe, is the core of Leibniz's account of God's permission of moral evil. He indicates in the Theodicy not only that it is the core of his account, but also that he has been committed to it for much of his career. Speaking of an early Latin dialogue he composed on evil and divine justice, uh, presumably the Confessio or a lost work, he writes, quote, That principle which I uphold here, namely that sin had been permitted because it had been involved in the best plan for the universe, was already applied there. Tad thinks that the story must be more complicated than this because it is not clear how it allows Leibniz to distinguish between God's merely permitting moral evil and his willing of physical evil. Leibniz does claim, in one of his statements about God's permission of moral evil, that it, moral evil, is, ne is ni neither an end nor a means, it is only a conditio sine qua non, while he elsewhere says of physical evil that, quote, God wills it often as a penalty owing to guilt, and often also as a means to an end, that is, to prevent greater evils or to obtain greater good. <clears throat> 
If Leibniz is willing to say that God wills physical evils to obtain greater good, shouldn't he also say that God wills moral evil to obtain greater good? Doesn't the basic distinction between God's antecedent and consequent willing described above imply that God does will moral evil as a means to creating the best possible world? This apparent difficulty, I take it, is what leads Tad to de-emphasize Leibniz's remarks on antecedent and consequent willing. I'm not convinced, though, that we should follow Tad here. First, I do not think that Leibniz is trying to draw a distinction between willing and permitting such that all physical evils are willed. And some of Tad's remarks suggest that Leibniz does aim to do this, and that is, in fact, what you hold. So on a number of occasions, uh, Leibniz speaks of God uh, permitting both physical and moral evil. In Theodicy 209, for example, he says, quote, the evil that is in rational creatures happens only by concomitants, not by antecedent will, but by a consequent will, as being involved in the best possible plan. And the metaphysical good, which includes everything, makes it necessary sometimes to admit physical evil and moral evil, as I have already explained more than once. All right, so I think I, I, I view this as a one of his key texts, and the fact that he says, look, I've said this many times, also suggests that, um, again, that this is his core account. It's five minutes, okay. Um, uh, there's a little, uh, I'll skip that. Well, it's clear from the context that Leibniz is using donner place as a synonym for the more frequently uh, used verbs permettre and admettre. That Leibniz typically uses permettre and admettre synonymously is clear from T24. That's just uh, something important as far as that passage goes. Uh, in addition to providing yet more evidence that the antecedent consequent will distinction is the centerpiece of Leibniz's account of God's permission of moral evil, this text also shows that Leibniz is willing to extend the analysis to cover at least some physical evils. And in the few texts that Leibniz does speak of God willing physical evils, he does not claim that God always wills physical evils, but only that he sometimes or often wills them as a means to, as means to an end. This leads us to a second point. Although it might seem natural to think that allowing moral evil because it is a part of the best possible plan for the universe is using moral evil as a means to an end, I do not think that Leibniz is conceiving of things in this manner. Or to put it slightly differently, Leibniz does not think that this is the best way to describe God's relation to moral evil. Consider the example that Leibniz uses to illustrate the point that God does not will moral evil as a means to an end. A queen who commits a crime on the pretext of saving the state. Leibniz is concerned to say that God's permission of moral evil is not like that, one shouldn't think of God as saying, wow, I can produce a better overall effect if David commits adultery. Hence, I shall create a world in which David commits adultery. The proper way to describe the situation is this. God understands the best possible plan for the universe. He sees that this plan includes various sins, such as David committing adultery. Considered individually, God does not will in favor of any of these sins, but he does permit them because they are included in the best possible world. One tricky point remains. What about the subset of physical evils that God does more than permit, that he wills in some sense? Again, I think it is helpful to consider the examples that Leibniz uses. God wills suffering, quote, is a penalty owing to guilt. Such penalties can also serve, he says, for, quote, amendment and example. His remarks continue, quote, Evil often serves to make us savor the good the more. Sometimes, too, it contributes to the greater perfection in him who suffers it, as the seed that one sows is subject to a kind of corruption before it can germinate. This is a beautiful similitude which Jesus Christ himself used, end quote. And elsewhere he writes, quote, One has no cause to complain of the fact that usually one attains salvation only through many sufferings and by bearing the cross of Jesus Christ, these evils serve to make the elect imitators of their master uh, and to increase their 
happiness. 